Historic Steamships, Part 2 of 3. Hi, I'm Vince. Welcome to the Vince Unlimited YouTube channel. And welcome to the second, middle part of a mini-series featuring stories about some historic ships which I discovered photographs of. If you haven't yet seen part one and would like to see this mini-series in order, please follow the link in the description below. In part one, I introduced how I found some turn of the 20th century early steamship original photographs amongst my family possessions. And I established that they were all probably taken and printed by my paternal great-great-grandfather, Henry Pointer, in or around Southampton docks, with many of the ships serving Second Boer War duties. I told the stories of HMT Idaho, HMT Kildonan Castle, RMS Majestic, the Mexican, and USMSS New York. So the next one on my alphabetical list would be HMT Roslyn Castle. The Roslyn Castle is a 380 feet long, iron, single screw British passenger mail ship steamer. It weighed 2,742 tonnes and would cruise at 12 knots. It was built in 1883 by Barclay, Curl and Company, Glasgow and launched on 24th of April of that year. The ship was built for D. Curry and Company of London. In 1888 it was lengthened and had its engines tripled. This provided 800 horsepower, allowing the ship to reach 15 knots despite the weight increase to 4,280 tonnes. Also that year Roslyn Castle transported the English national cricket team known as Major R.G. Wharton's team, to play the inaugural first-class international cricket match with South Africa. In 1896, the ship was transferred to Castle Mail Packets Company and was involved in taking troops to South Africa on 4th of April 1896 as part of the Jameson Raid. The raid was intended to start an uprising, but failed in its mission. But it did become a contributory cause of the Second Boer War three years later. Although by then the vessel was under Union Castle Mail SS Company Limited, HMT Roslyn Castle was involved in many trips to South Africa, taking troops to that war as troop ship numbered HMT 26, as seen in this photograph. In fact, on one occasion she took a young Winston Churchill, future British Second World War Prime Minister, there as a war correspondent. I like to optimistically think it was this photograph that captured that departure. On another occasion in December 1899, the ship Armenian hit the Roslyn Castle, damaging some of her rail and davits. Roslyn Castle was also used to transport Boer prisoners of war from South Africa to India. For example, 507 men on the 11th of April 1901. In RC's later years, the ship obtained a poor reputation for breaking down. Nothing to do with a dented rail or davits, I guess. In 1905, it was renamed Regina by owners M. Jansen of Hamburg. But just two years later, in May 1907, the ship was broken up in Genoa after suffering major heavy weather damage. HMHS Spartan. Her Majesty's hospital ship, HMHS Spartan, started life as a Union Steamship Co. Southampton passenger cargo iron steam screw on 12th July 1881. Like the city of New York I spoke of in part one of this series, the ship was built by James and George Thompson in Clydebank. Weighing in at 3,487 tonnes, the vessel was over 363 feet long and had 600 nautical horsepower. In October 1899, Spartan was requisitioned as a hospital ship and converted at Southampton with accommodation for 144 sick. Spartan was given the transport number 11. From the smart, clean finish of the ship as photographed, it's likely the shot was taken around November 1899, just after its conversion. I haven't discovered much more about the ship, but it clearly survived all its Boer War exploits, as its end came in April 1902, when it was finally broken up in Italy. But it's definitely worth including in the collection, as it's a lovely, clear photograph. SS St. Louis. SS St. Louis was a twin screw transatlantic passenger line of 11,659 tonnes. It was launched on 12th of November 1894, built by William Cramp and Sons Building and Engine Company of Philadelphia for the American line. 
The maiden voyage took him from New York to Southampton in June 1895. But only a few months later, after the transatlantic crossings by this vessel and similar sister ships and Paul were too slow, they underwent modifications. And they both returned to service considerably faster. In April 1898, St. Louis was chartered at Southampton as an armed cruiser for use in the Spanish-American War, for clarity on the American side. The ship was renamed USS St. Louis by the United States Navy and fitted with four five-inch guns. It doesn't sound very big at all until you realise that's the gun's shell diameter, not the gun length. The ship also had eight six-pounders fitted. Manned by 350 men with 27 officers under Captain Caspar Goodrich, St. Louis set off for the Caribbean to deploy heavy drag lines. These were deployed in order to destroy undersea communication links between the West Indies and South America, between Guantanamo Bay and Haiti, and also cables serving Cuba. Plus, the ship was also involved in several naval battles and bombardments, including capturing merchant ships and transporting prisoners of war. St. Louis finally returned to the States for decommissioning back in the shipyard in Philadelphia in August after a busy five month service. Renamed back to SS St. Louis, the ship returned to commercial transatlantic service after having her guns and six pounders replaced by buns and quarter pounders. Probably. Resuming trips on the regular Southampton to New York route, the steamship paused only during 1903 to be fitted with new boilers and taller funnels. And again during 1913 to be converted to carry second and third class passengers. From 1914, during the first half of the First World War, St. Louis changed to serving a Liverpool to New York route. But in 1917, as renamed vessel SP-1644, or the more snappily titled USS Louisville, had another three guns fitted, this time six-inch ones. Cue same old joke. During service on one memorable occasion, the vessel dodged out of the way of an incoming torpedo, successfully hitting the submarine that had fired it. And apparently that wasn't the only encounter with a U-boat. The final war efforts were spent as a troop transport, up to the end of the war in 1919. Following that, in January 1920, and renamed back to St. Louis, the ship caught fire, causing her to be scuttled in Hoboken during a refit back to commercial service in New York. This effectively meant the ship never sailed again and was eventually taken to Genoa in Italy for scrapping in 1925. I've no idea of the exact date of this photograph. It must have been somewhere between 1899 and 1914, as the ship does not appear to be fitted with guns, unless they really were only five or six inches big. A clue could lie in the funnel size increase made to the ship in 1903, but I have not seen any datable photographs or card depictions of alternate funnel heights. My guess, due to the inclusion with the other photographs in the collection, would be that this was taken around 1900, before the larger funnel refit. SS Suvik this rather broken steamship started life as a Belfast-built vessel of 12,531 gross tons by Harland and Wolfe. It was able to carry 400 third-class passengers plus refrigerated cargo for the White Star Line. It made journeys between Liverpool and Sydney via Cape Town and its story is peppered with interest. SS Suvik was launched in December 1900 and the maiden voyage was in March 1901. However, the ship was soon pressed into service as troop transport during the Second Boer War, returning after that to her commercial role. On one notable trip, a young Charles Lightroller, the future Titanic second in command and the most senior serving survivor, was assigned to Suvik as punishment. Whereupon he met his 18 year old wife on board. Severe punishment indeed. However, it was handy as he was then able to marry her in Sydney when they arrived. Things sailed along nicely for Suvik until February 1907 when, when it all went a bit unshipshaped. Leaving Melbourne, the vessel headed for Cape Town, then proceeded to Tenerife, then set sail for Plymouth in England. The course intended to continue on to London and finally Liverpool, which seems a bit of an odd routing choice. Hey, don't judge, I'm just reporting the story as I read it myself. However, 
Just outside Plymouth on 17th of March 1907, in thick fog, rain and strong winds, Suvik's crew miscalculate the distance to the Lizard Lighthouse by an incredible 16 miles. As a result, the ship ran full speed into the shore, hitting a series of part submerged rocks known as Manheer Reef at Stag Rock. This must have come as a bit of shock to the 524 people on board. I assume the £400,000 worth of frozen sheep carcasses also carried on board at the time were almost certainly not the least bit concerned. Despite major damage, the Suvik didn't sink and Captain Thomas Johnson Jones was able to attempt several tries at reversing off the rocks, all unsuccessfully. Thankfully, all passengers and crew were saved by the gallant efforts of the RNLI, lifeboat cruiser, their largest ever rescue in its history. They saved, in total, 141 crew members and 382 passengers, which included 70 babies, and a presumably embarrassed captain, all just using four open wooden lifeboats, together manned by 24 local volunteers. Then, just as the 16-hour ordeal had ended, the SS Jubba also ran aground within sight along the same coastline. And the lifeboat crews, aided by some of the Suvik crew this time, carried out another rescue. For their efforts, two members of the Suvik crew were awarded RNLI Silver Gallantry Medals, alongside four of the lifeboat volunteers for their own work during the rescues. Captain Jones himself was awarded as well, awarded liability for the accident and had his competency certificate withdrawn, coinciding neatly with his immediate retirement. Although the bow of the Suvik was crumpled beyond salvage, the rest of the ship, including the boilers and engines, was intact. So the aforementioned cargo of indifferent sheep bits was removed and several attempts were made to pull the vessel off the rocks at higher tides. All attempts were unsuccessful, and at each try the ship was taken back by the force of nature, further into the rocky reef. With forecasts of worsening weather and most thought abandonment to nature was the only option. But the Liverpool and Glasgow Salvage Association, acting on behalf of White Star Line, came up with a brave plan to dynamite the front section of way using divers, or rather explosives set by divers, because divers aren't naturally enough explosive themselves. The explosive idea was that it would leave the movable 120 metre long middle and rear end bit, which could be rebuilt anew. The theory being that it was a cheaper option than having to create a whole new ship. The ambitious and dangerous plan was actually successful, and on 2nd of April 1907, the Suvik, or rather the rear 400 feet of it, drifted free, assisted by a remaining watertight bulkhead. It worked so well, the ship, or what was left of it, could reverse under its own steam. Guided only by tugs all the way to Southampton's Test Key, just two days later. After that, the SS Suvik was transferred to the Harland and Wolf owned Trafalgar Dry Dock in Southampton. Here, the vessel awaited a new 65 metre nose to be built in Belfast, at which point it became known as the longest ship ever, being a third in Northern Ireland and two thirds on the south coast of England. It was in Southampton sometime in 1907 that these two photographs were taken as the new bow arrived on 26th of October that year. The Highland and Wolf team were joined by shipbuilders from J.I. Thornycroft and the largest ever cut and shut ship was completed by mid-January 1908. The ship continued its runs to Australia whilst in readiness for Royal Naval Service but wasn't called upon until the First World War in 1914. This was a commission to take British troops to Greece. Not on holiday, but to the Dardanelles campaign under the title Hard Military Australian Transport or HMAT A29 Suvik. Suvik survived the war and was refitted in 1920 to carry 266 second class passengers returning to familiar Australian commutes. It completed its 50th trip in 1924 Suvik carried on going until 1928 when the ship was sold to Ingar Vistendal's Finval, A.S. of Tonsberg, Norway, for 35 grand. It was renamed Skittering and converted to an Atlantic whaling ship, complete with a new stern ramp. 
The whaling continued until the Second World War commenced. In April 1940, along with several other ships, Skitterin was interned in Gothenburg, Sweden. Norway wanted their ship back, but met with legal resistance due to a squabble between the exiled Norwegian government and the German collaborationist Norwegian government. As a result, in April 1942, 10 ships, including Skitterin, made a dash for it out of port towards the safety of some British warships. Sweden protested against this manoeuvre, so the ships headed for international waters, but met awaiting tipped off German ships. Only two made it to the safety of the British ships. Two were sunk by the Germans, the rest, including the ex Suvik, were voluntarily scuttled by their crew, with one crewman lost and the other 110 becoming prisoners of war. The fascinating Suvik story didn't quite fully end in the waters off Sweden in the early 40s. Lying in 70 metre depth of water, the wreckage still housed a large amount of oil in the tanks and in 2005 was reported to be leaking and the still decaying hull is now threatening an environmental incident. Unidentified ships. The collection also contains three other photographs of ships which I failed to identify. There were many ships operating from Southampton at the time and these photos do not contain enough individually identified data for me to positively name or date them. This one, for instance, could be a Union Castle Mail Ship Company vessel. These were common at the time and were usually painted white. However, not all light coloured ships were from the Union Castle Mail Steamship Company. If you know how to identify this ship, please comment below for the benefit of the rest of the class. Some clues may lie with the twin funnels a fairly common sight, or perhaps the height of the funnels, a less common feature, or possibly the three masts, sadly also fairly commonplace. The next photograph was larger, so should make identifying distinct attributes of this ship easier, other than the fact that on your screen it's no bigger or smaller than any of the others. The same comments which I raised before might well be said about this ship as well. However, note the backward slope in funnels. Although the fact that there are only two and the ship has a fairly standard set of three masts doesn't assist in identification. The photo is in black and white, so I cannot be certain of the hull colour, but assuming it was black, it could be a Union Company line vessel. But even using that fact doesn't allow me to name the actual vessel. If only the angle of the composition was more acute, then a nameplate may have been visible on the rear, which would have made this task so much easier. Again, if you know the identity of this ship, Please add a comment below. Finally, another ship with a dark hull and twin funnels, but this time apparently smaller in physical size, so only supporting twin masks. That is if you discount the rearward post, which appears to be there just to support a vessel lamp. Again, if black hulled, is it serving the Union Company line? Or are those funnels actually red perhaps? If only colour photography was common at the time. Do you know what that ship was? Answers on a postcard. But also post the result below as I can't see your postcard from where I'm sitting. In researching this series I gathered information from a number of online sources including angloborewar.com, bncstaffregister.com, clydeships.co.uk, greatships.net, norwayheritage.com, queensroyalsurrey.org.uk, rollofhonour.com, uboat.net, en.wikipedia.org, and wrecksite.eu. If you enjoyed hearing my stories of these ships, why not seek out the third and final part of this mini-series? In this I fully detail my reasons for assuming it was my great-great-grandfather who took the photos and then tell the stories of two similarly aged vessels which had a particular role in my own family story. You can subscribe to this Vince Unlimited channel to get this content or use the links I'll post below. The photographs shown in this video are all from my family collection. For those who are interested, all editing was carried out by me on my iPad Air 4th generation. I made the titles using Kino app overlaying the original footage filmed on my iPhone 10. I wrote and narrated this true storyline which I first posted in my Vince Unlimited WordPress article dated 17th of October 2021.
This has been a film by Vince, copyright 2022. Thank you for watching and see you in another video.